Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our next, now our next speaker, uh, Professor Ram Sassi Sekaran. Professor Sassi Sekaran is director of the Harvard MIT Division of Health Science and Technology. He is a leading scholar and entrepreneur. Professor Sassi Sekaran is a pioneer in the glycomics, the study of complex sugars. And his work has yielded important breakthrough for disease processes such as avian influenza and generic pharmaceutical opportunities. Indeed, he is the founder of Momento Pharmaceutical, which produced the first biosimilar low molecular weight heparin and reached one billion dollar sale within the first year of its launch. Today, Professor Sassi Sekran will talk to us about how the conversion of the life sciences, physical sciences, and engineering sciences is leading to new solutions for pressing medical challenges. And uh, Professor Sassi Karan must be, I think, in the back. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I guess I have a challenge to make sure that all of you stay awake, and I'll do my best in doing that. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, the invitation for what is appearing to be a very exciting meeting. Um, initially, I wondered, uh, seeing these uh, wonderful uh, uh, cartoons, that uh, the thing that I was asked to do to come to the stage is actually wear that dress, but I'm glad I didn't. because. When I beat academic entrepreneurship, one of the things I was going to say is part of being entrepreneurial was you've heard about what Brad Pitt did when he, had to, when he was uh, selected as an actor for Troy. He actually decided to get uh, fit, went to the gym for three months, became uh, buff. So I thought that's what I have to do here, but uh, I can guarantee you that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I've done that too. <laughs> so with that, what I'd like to do, if I could have the first slide, please, um, uh, is to is to describe to you what I mean by academic entrepreneurship in the context of convergence in life sciences. Um, I think it's, in, in a general sense, what I mean by entrepreneurship is not the, general, the, the view of commercialization as such, but it's how you think, how you really apply yourself to solve problems. And, and to me, that's one of the most important things that I can uh, stand in front to uh, uh, not only uh, say it with excitement and with, with conviction because uh, as I understand there are several high school students here and uh, students from um, uh, NTU. So part of what I'd like to do today is to sort of frame those issues around that more broadly. So um, given that this is a symposium that's focusing on life sciences, I guess one of the fundamental questions that you would ask is why do we do biomedical education and research? Uh, needless to say, one of the critical elements of that is the fact that uh, not only does it lead to knowledge, but um, knowledge to be applied in meaningful ways, and that is solving problems in health. Uh, an important point that I would like to say to the future generation is that this isn't an overall domain that has done fairly well in the US. Uh, it's perhaps the largest growth uh, in, in terms of a, of a sector, if you will, uh, uh, you know, compares with uh, high technology, I mean, uh, uh, high technology such as IT and so on. And so uh, it's important for you to know that uh, th there's a good future, there's a robustness associated with that. While that may well be the case, there is another issue that essentially is fairly significant in the backdrop, which is the amount of money that United States and several countries spend in terms of uh, uh, health as such, which is uh, treating patients who are unwell. And you can see that, like the world population, this has increased significantly in the last 20 years to, a, to an unsustainable scale. So it is indeed true that healthcare cost is a significant problem of the future and one that clearly frames the issue of not only under doing science, understanding science, but trying to apply science in a meaningful way so that there are s solutions to this problem. And if I were to sort of uh, make a little bit of a joke associated with that, um, you know, the healthcare cost in terms of the American economy is such that it really has a very uh, significant effect. So if you break down on some of these numbers, 31% of income of a, of a household in the United States essentially is spent on healthcare. It's about a seventh of the GDP, and it's growing. And we had the 
the Patient Care Act, which is supposed to provide universal health care to the entire uh, population, is not only going to add to the expense, but we've never figured out how we're going to, spend, uh, how we're going to pay for it. So what it underscores is really a need for innovation that not only has the positive impact of making a difference, but making a difference in a pragmatic way. So to me, this is an extremely important element of the future of how, how we not only do research, but how we think about sol problems to solve in this arena. If not, uh, this is what's going to happen. We're going to cut cost and move to China, as they say. <laughs> so um, on a serious note, um, I think as we heard from some of our speakers this morning, uh, we're essentially uh, in a very, very exciting time uh, for, you know, to be uh, a, a human being on this planet. And most of you are aware of the fact that the advances in nanotechnology, information technology, imaging and computing has truly transformed um, uh, engineering and engineering sciences, uh, and it's led to the iPhones, the iPads, the Facebooks, and the Twitters of the world, and that has been a game changer the last five, 10 years of our lives specifically. And that process of convergence of technology and science and engineering is beginning to have a huge impact in life sciences. Um, and you heard some of the uh, points that were made, made earlier this morning. Advances in molecular biology, particularly genomics, has really not only created a new knowledge base, but that new knowledge base is framed in a way that in order to scale it, we truly need to think about this problem in a much more systems way or a much more integrated way to be able to access not only the knowledge but have the impact associated with that knowledge. So the emergence of convergence, if you will, of life sciences and engineering is truly what is going to have a major impact of not only in terms of how we understand life sciences, but how that will lead to disruptive technologies that are much needed to solve some of the most challenging problems. So to the young high school students that are in this audience, uh, what I hope you will be the future torchbearers would be to be able to see these big problems require us to think big, but how we think about it is going to be key to be able to solve this. Needless to say, the transformation of engineering sciences led to globalization, and globalization as we know in terms of how communication, uh, connectivities, and so on has really transformed the world. It has also changed the way that medicine is practiced, medicine is delivered, and particularly an, an aspect that I'm going to come back to today, uh, given uh, one of the key elements of globalization has been how manufacturing has changed, how manufacturing has had an impact in terms of uh, global medicine. Um, so what is convergence? It is really an interdisciplinary shift of how research can be conducted, inclusive of a range of knowledge from microbiology, computer science, engineering design. So it's really more the how we go about doing this, the way we think about doing it, that has been a paradigm shift. So it's not formed by a particular scientific advance or a particular breakthrough, but it's truly the integration of how we approach this problem. So it is important for the younger generation to appreciate the significance of this, and in part, we as educators not only need to think about this in the context of where the world is going, but how we train younger generations to appreciate why it is critical for us to think along these lines. And you heard a few examples. The previous speaker talked about nanotechnology, um, and you heard the sessions this morning. Uh, at the end of the day, it's not a single individual or a single set of observations that make things possible. In this day of an age of Facebook and Twitter, it is the collective communication of how we apply a diverse, strong foundation in science and engineering that is going to enable us to tackle these important problems. So part of it is how life sciences has also changed the last uh, 10, 15 years. Um, historically, it was uh, biology has always taken a fairly reductionist approach. Uh, every cell was viewed in a very simple way uh, in terms of its reduction. And that led to the, uh, and that was largely possible because of the, the technologies that we had in terms of being able to sequence DNA and proteins, and that led to the first revolution, the biotech revolution, as we uh, got to know and appreciate, uh, which was uh, the recombinant DNA technology. Now, the story has become far more complex. We don't look at cells in isolation, that looked in the context of a microenvironment. And a lot of this is possible because we don't just look at it as a single gene or a single protein. We look at sets of genes and sets of proteins. Our ability to manipulate uh, organisms in terms of whole organism genetics. The tools that have 
come to play in terms of population-based approach. So the sort of what we call as the omics or a systems approach has been this major shift. And the second revolution, which was sort of our ability to sequence the human genome that we heard earlier this morning, has really set the stage to this third revolution as, as we sort of are trying to define it in terms of now that you have a system uh, with this type of complexity, how do you really bring in the different uh, technologies and engineering principles to solve this problem? It's not a luxury, it's a necessity in terms of being able to uh, uh, unravel uh, the biological systems. Uh, just to put it in a cellular perspective, we now have ways to understand how cells make decisions, how cells divide, how cells migrate, how cells die. We can zoom in on pathways. We're still uh, you know, uh, breaking new grounds and new frontiers in this. But if you step back and look at the bigger picture, uh, this is one of my favorite slides because one of the key elements of bringing biology and engineering is the whole notion of what I call as molecule demand in terms of the number of components that is able to define, uh, at the end of the day, a human system, going from number of genes to number of proteins to number of cells and the, and the tissue type and so on, and not to necessarily look at these as discrete systems, but systems that are related in a hierarchical fashion where it's not just qualitative measurements, but truly quantitative measurements that could be uh, applied in a meaningful way to be able to do this. And at the heart of this, and this is something that I take very seriously in terms of our educational activities, is what we call about a more systems way of looking at structure function. When I was trained as a biochemist or a biophysicist, we always looked at a protein, we looked at a residue, we looked at the interaction of a given residue. Yes, that is important. That forms the foundation of how we look at it. But now, since we have several different techniques of how you manipulate a system, and then using different te technologies, the way you measure these systems, and once you form a lot of data systems, then you have informatics to be able to uh, bring these data sets and then start making certain predictions. And this integrated way of being able to manipulate, measure, mine, and model, the four Ms, is going to be at the heart of how we looked at structure function relationship going forward in a much more systems way. And I think from an education point of view, we cannot view as these disciplines that teach us in, in silos, but the boundaries of disciplines are going to be much, much more diffuse, and our ability to cross between disciplines is one of the key elements to be able to access this. And I, I, one of my colleagues said, you know, the fifth M, if you will, is how you make. Uh, that's the translation piece that becomes pretty exciting. So is this all real? Of course, we're now being to do large-scale team science, and from my own perspective, we're part of this group, which I'm going to come back to using a very specific example, which is glycobiology, called glycomics, uh, how uh, we cannot, for the sake of the field and for the problems we want to solve, uh, act in isolation. We need to be able to coordinate in terms of how we manipulate single cells and looking at mouse or humans to be able to understand structure function relationship and such team science is indeed possible and I, I don't think there was a more perfect example than what we heard about the genomics uh, this morning every person that you uh, every paper that you saw had a list of about 25 30 to 50 people because it does take a village if you will to be able to tackle these types of complex problems and the more we get into rigorous structure function relationship we need to be able to do that so with this broad backdrop, if you will, in terms of convergence and where convergence is going, one of the things that I'd like to do today is to give you a very specific example, a story that I was a part of, a story that I had the privilege to lead, uh, which focuses on safety of medicine, which uh, is a consequence of globalization. In large part, uh, uh, as you know, uh, much of how uh, medicines are made in terms of either it's pharmaceutical companies producing small chemicals such as aspirin or Lipitor and so on and so forth, the entire globalization has shifted, if you will, the manufacturing base from the West to the East. And particularly countries like China and India are now the largest sources of these kinds of molecules. Now behind that is the fact that several biopharmaceutical products, these are protein-based products, close to about $100 billion worth of drugs are going to go off patent, and a lot of these are put, going to be made in uh, the rest of the world. And at the heart of this is a fundamental problem that we're going to face uh, from the point of view of safety of medicines. And this has been something that people have been very concerned with, 
and a prediction that the problem was going to indeed happen, happened in 2008. And what I'm going to do today is tell you a story, a story about the science, the technology that was used to solve the problem. It was public health related because several people were dying. And by using technologies uh, in a meaningful way, we not only came up with an assay that was able to help us quarantine unsafe drugs, but essentially it saved a lot of lives. So what I'll do today is to give you uh, a sense of what that story is. But before I do that, I'm just gonna show you a, a brief clip that will uh, give you a, a sense of what that uh, 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 overall context to the uh, uh, story is. This has to deal with the drug heparin. Williams. Heparin is a blood thinner widely used in surgery. Now heparin is under investigation after as many as 62 people died after taking the drug. An FDA investigation uncovered contaminants in some of the drug's ingredients made in China. Heparin's maker, Baxter International, recalled most supplies two months ago. Now Congress is weighing in, holding hearings, and questioning the oversight of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. FDA Commissioner Andrew von Essenbach conceded more must be done to prevent tainted drugs from coming into the U.S. The solution is not simply to just do more of what we have done in the past, but we must do things differently. The latest review from the Government Accountability Office found the agency checked only 11 percent of the more than 3,200 foreign companies that served drug makers in 2007. The GAO estimated that it would cost between 67 to $71 million to inspect all foreign makers every two years. The FDA has proposed spending about $11 million on foreign inspections in fiscal 2008. Representative John Dingell of Michigan said that was not good enough. Commissioner, I have nothing, no ill will towards you. I have ill will of the most gross sort towards the fact that you come up here and defend a situation that is indefensible and that you are not soliciting the resources that you need to do your job to protect the American people the way the law says you should. More than 80 percent of active ingredients in U.S. drugs come from abroad, and more than half from India and China. Deborah Luterbeck, Reuters. So um, you heard uh, John Diggle basically saying that the FDA is not using the resources. It was very ironic. Indeed, the FDA tried its best to use the resources. So I'm going to tell you the story behind the story because this is an illustrative example of not only how technology was used to uh, address the issue of saving lives, but one that we think is a, a, a typical example of how we need to be thinking about future type of problems, particularly in the area of either drug or medicine contamination, or to be able to address complex systems where we need to get to the, to the bottom of the biology but using uh, technology. So this story had politics. China basically saying it was not their problem, um, even though the, uh, the raw material came from China. Uh, you heard that uh, uh, the, the U.S. Congress took this very seriously. There was a hearing called Heparin Disaster Hearing that lasted for several weeks where the FDA got drilled. Uh, you saw the FDA commissioner who had to defend how the FDA went about solving this problem. Uh, and as I said, Heparin was just used as a case in point to many of the other things that were just tip of the iceberg in terms of the challenges that the FDA uh, uh, was facing. And needless to say, the saddest part was this gentleman lost both his wife and son in a matter of a week uh, because they were both patients uh, undergoing dialysis in two different centers that had this drug heparin, I'm going to come back to in a minute, uh, that they used heparin and uh, within a matter of uh, a few hours they passed away. And so of course obviously he testified it and that brought in the most significant human element. So what I'm going to do today is talk about it in the context of convergence, the fact that several groups of us, uh, and I had the privilege to lead this group, coming together, and this is a busy slide, I'm not going to walk through each of those points, but in a matter of about four weeks, figure out what the contaminant was chemically, bringing the different technologies to address that, number one. Number two, determine biologically what it was, and link it finally to the piece of what was going on in patients, 
and to be able to bring it all together to say, here's the contaminant, here's the biological mechanisms, and this is what was observed clinically. And uh, this is perhaps the most significant slide. What you see here is the number of deaths over a period of few months starting uh, end of 2007 into early 2008, uh, when the FDA and CDC came together and, and Baxter, which is the source of hep supplier for heparin, recalled, in the moment we were able to develop a test and, and then we thought it was very important to get the information out publicly and so we published these results. Uh, uh, after identifying the biological contaminant, you saw the fact that the deaths, uh, number of deaths came to baseline. And that was the most rewarding experience of this whole process. So what is heparin? So, heparin is one of the most prescribed class of drugs in the world. Uh, it's essentially an anticoagulant, it's a blood thinner. Uh, it's a byproduct of the food industry. Uh, we, we heard a speaker talk about this in the morning. We no longer can have drugs made from animal sources. Uh, um, it is used, uh, I mean, the way I describe heparin is heparin in a hospital is like aspirin at home. You, you, you need it for headache, you need it anytime anybody undergoes surgery. Uh, it, it is a byproduct of the food industry, and it's, it's a product that's been around for 80 years with no major contaminant. Uh, it was grandfathered, uh, which is a whole other separate issue. The tests that were used to make sure heparin was safe was relatively simple, and that's, that has been part of the problem. And, and, and countries that have a large supply of pigs, and China being the, uh, the top most, hence is a source of, of heparin. Um, I'm gonna to come to this in a minute uh, in greater detail. Uh, it's, a, it's a disaccharide repeating unit. Um, so you heard about genomics today. Uh, and then you make proteins. The important final uh, third biopolymer is polysaccharides, and heparin is an example of a, a polysaccharide. It's a complex mixture, um, and so it's, uh, it's made in the Golgi. Uh, one of the important elements is unlike DNA and proteins, which have an open reading frame and a template for synthesis, these complex molecules are uh, derived in the Golgi. They are not digital in nature, they're analog, and how we go about uh, bringing technologies to uh, characterize them has always been a challenge. So from a molecular perspective, studying heparin-like members has essentially uh, uh, re revisited the central dogma, if you will. We know that DNA makes RNA makes proteins, one of the most extensive and complex post-translation modification is glycosylation, which is adding sugars to a protein which provides the functional diversity. We heard about this whole concept about phenotype, going from the genotype to phenotype. Our view is that several of the functional diversity associated with the uh, protein products is at the hands of these polysaccharides that modify proteins. So this is, a, this is a slide that describes about close to seven to 10 years of work from our lab. Uh, long and short of it is what we did was develop several orthogonal techniques, uh, analytical techniques, to be able to sort of read the code, if you will, of the backbone of uh, a linear chain. So this is very similar to being able to read the code for DNA, but what we did do was a similar approach along the lines of what we heard this morning about a shotgun approach, being able to take snapshots. But one way of uh, describing this complex technology platform is, is like imaging. The more resolution you have in terms of different techniques you use, you, you, you arrive at a solution by eliminating things that don't satisfy. And yes, we use the power of computation too, which is we, uh, you had four alphabets for DNA, you had 32 building blocks that make carbohydrates. So to be able to capture all these pieces of information, we didn't have al enough alphabets, so we came up with a hexadecimal coding system and a binary operation, and that formed the foundation of how we were able to then take different analytical technologies and come up with constraints. And so every building block, you can now store information in terms of coupling constants of uh, protons or linkage information or how enzymes clip them or how NMR is able to look at various signatures. And that formed the basis of what we call as a glycomics database of this large consortium of functional glycomics that I uh, pointed out to you, uh, which involves about 500 investigators now. And that also was the basis of creating these relational databases for the genomics and proteomics database. Um, so if you're interested, we've had a lot of different publications on that. But this was an important uh, set of tools that we developed, which formed the basis of being able to then access the question to say for linear glycans. I'm just showing you a prototype of a cell with ant-like structures, which is the protein with the glycan chains radiating. How do we go from here, which is black and white, where you're looking at smaller chains to larger chains, 
the issue you have, unlike for DNA, you have a given sequence, you have length and composition and abundance to be able to go from uh, something like that to one where you're able to then decode and, uh, and come up with the solution in terms of sequences. Uh, unlike DNA and proteins, which are linear in nature, one of the inherent challenges of carbohydrates is they're both linear and they branch. So for instance, if you take EPO, which is a, a biopharmaceutical product, there are four different sites where you could modify them in terms of glycosylation. And what, you show, what I show here is distinct glycosylation at a given site, and you can now think of for a, for a given protein, the number of glycosylation and the occupancy of glycosylation to be able to give distinct, close to about 150 to 200 distinct structures. What's particularly challenging is in the context of biopharmaceutical production, subtle changes in process can change the type of glycosylation at a given site, and that has huge implications on safety. So uh, this technology platform led to uh, uh, a, a sort of a foundation to address two things. Given that several biopharmaceutical drugs were coming off patent, we created this company called Momenta Pharmaceutical to largely focus on a regulatory framework of how do you address complex mixtures such as heparin and uh, by, uh, glycoproteins uh, and to be able to, um, uh, you know, to put this technology to use. And uh, so this started in 2001, and just as Jackie said, uh, you know, a, a, pro a particular derivative of heparin, uh, a low molecular weight heparin called enoxaparin, uh, was, you know, a, a version of that was uh, generated in our laboratory at MIT, and it was launched in 2010 uh, after a number of years, and within a year it became a billion dollar drug, and uh, this formed a framework of how to think about these types of technology and their applications. Now, let me switch gears and talk about heparin isolation in the context of this contaminant. It, um, essentially, it's isolated from pig intestine. You separate the intestine, heat it up, then use racine to precipitate it, then you uh, wash the racine with alcohol, and then um, heparin is dried. It's a fairly simple technology. It was robust and complex, but given the transformation of, due to globalization and manufacturing, this is what it's uh, translated to do. Here's the pig intestine, it's separated, heated in a vat, and uh, these buckets are used to, uh, uh, you know, alcohol precipitate, and here's your filtration with a cloth, and this is the active pharmaceutical ingredient. I guess most of you in the audience should be in shock. That's exactly the way I was, because that's not how you produce a drug, but that's how a drug was being produced. So um, the background to this, and this is one of the other remarkable thing about uh, the healthcare system and healthcare monitoring, uh, at least in the United States, if you have a particular hospital that it has things going on and there's certain things that are not going okay, let's say there's an outbreak, if you will, and this is what happened during the discovery of the HIV virus, and this is what happened very specifically during the outbreak of the 2009 H1N1 swine flu. We again had the privilege of working with the uh, the, the U.S. Center for Disease Control to provide the first functional characterization of the swine flu, uh, where again the swine flu uses glycans on epithelial cells to achieve tropism. But in the context of this presentation, this coordination between the hospital, the CDC, and the public health department of a given state essentially led them to figure out that there was something going on in, in California, and then the CDC publishes these what's called as MMWR report, which is a mortality um, uh, a weekly report, a morbidity and mortality weekly report, and that then quickly leads to looking at what are the cases and probable cases. And I'm using swine flu as an example, but this is what happened with the contaminated heparin. It was a smart intern who were paying attention to these allergic reaction that young babies were undergoing in St. Louis, Missouri. And the FDA was quickly brought into the picture because it's a coordination between a hospital, St. Louis Health Department, and they brought in the CDC, and the CDC brought in the FDA. And this all happened in the matter of about three to four weeks. And the FDA reached out to me, given that we had developed a whole range of technologies, since this is the first uh, NMR data that they were trying to interpret. And I'm not going to go into the detail on the science because it's fairly complex, but it was fairly clear to them that there was something wrong with, with heparin. And that's why the FDA really got more seriously involved, got Baxter involved in the picture. And in a matter of about three weeks, there's a good coordination in terms of quarantining the heparin, CDC looking at what was really happening nationwide, and the FDA trying to really find out where the source of this problem was. Interestingly, at the same time, 
Um, there was a viral epidemic in China, uh, a particular virus called the purse virus, or, a, or it's also known as the swine blue ear virus. Said so the other thing that I do uh, is also uh, work in uh, several RNA viruses, so immediately I was tuned on to this. And, several, and, and these viruses infect pigs and, um, and uh, essentially led to a huge amount of pig shortage in China. So what I'm going to do now is to kind of quickly go through a set of things that really came together in that defined timeline. The first thing that we did was to demonstrate that this particular contaminant was deliberately done, was to mimic heparin using another polysaccharide backbone called chondroitin sulfate. And uh, it was called oversulfated chondroitin. And so we demonstrated this as a team science. We published this in Nature Biotech. Then the second thing we did was come up with uh, a handle of what was this substance doing biologically? How did it kill the people mechanistically? And to be able to demonstrate that, uh, and we, we, and the first study was done in a matter of about three weeks. The second study was done in parallel in about three to four weeks. And finally, with the CDC, we were then able to correlate whatever we observed chemically and biologically in terms of the population through the epidemiological study. And the last two publications were published again in, in uh, New England Journal. And these three were coordinated. The first two were released about the same time. Uh, behind this is the challenge to study these systems. These complex molecules are difficult to study. They have overlapping signals and really co complicated analytical techniques need to come together. And this is a busy slide. I'm not going to go through this, but suffice to say, several different techniques were used to compare normal versus contaminated heparin batches, isolated, purified, and analyzed. And then we were able to then de novo synthesize. So I'm going to give you a punchline here, which is the fact that there was shortage of pigs in China. Uh, there was a shortage, therefore, of heparin supply. Uh, for reasons we still do not know, somebody took a heparin like molecule, which is called chondritin, sulfated it to look like heparin, and for it to have the same anticoagulant activity, and uh, uh, deliberately introduced into the market. And the story is very similar to those of you who have heard about melamine, which affected several children in China. Um, and so here's the chemical. Then what we had to do, which was equally important, because and, and the first part of the study essentially gave us a test that we were able to put in place to make sure that the, 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 the supply of heparin was safe. The second piece that needed to happen was the CDC came up with a list of criteria. And keep in mind, the people who are getting heparin were fairly sick patients themselves. But they had what was broadly described as an anaphylactoid and an anaphylaxis kind of a response leading to a system crash. You had a, a massive response and people died. You had, the, essentially it was a sort of a systems failure. And this was the original slide that the CDC generated saying, how do we tackle this biologically? There are a number of possible mechanisms. It could be direct effects, or it could be cellular effects, or it could be an immune system activation. And each of them had several subcomponents. It could be uh, um, you know, based on antibody response, or it could be a histamine release. And the key question is, how do we really bring this together to be able to solve this? So keep in mind, this is happening in China. Uh, there are two parts to this. This is the part that I'm talking about is the, the, uh, the swine blue ear virus, which is shown there, the blue ears of the pigs. And it, was, it was interesting that these viruses infected macrophages of the pigs, and these macrophages secreted a proteoglycan that had chondroitin sulfate E, which is very sort of similar to heparin in terms of being highly sulfated. So one of the immediate concerns that the FDA had was this a biological source? And this would have become a far more complex problem. So while we knew there was something unusual in the chemical structure, we needed to make sure that biologically this is what was not was happening. And you know what allergic reactions are. Uh, essentially, you could have hives and swelling, which is typically seen in, in patients. And if you can have extreme allergy reaction, something as, as beautiful as this, in a matter of 10 minutes, could have a, a severe response. And you can think about the type of a response a, a sick patient can undergo. So the way we were able to quickly put into place was one of the leaders in the field of anaphylactoid response, Frank Austin from Harvard Medical School, a dear colleague of mine, had actually noted that dextran sulfate and oversulfated chondroitin, uh, by accident, they'd made some observation, had certain types of anaphylactoid response. And the fact that there was a product in the market in Germany called artiparin, which is oversulfated chondroitin, 
that is similar to the contamination. Now you can begin to see really diverse expertise really came together to be able to say what are the kinds of questions that we really needed to ask. Cutting a long story short, what was really happening is when you had a negative charge polymer, it had a, 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 an amplification or a cascade mechanism where a particular protease called factor 12 was activated. Once it was activated, it essentially activated another protein called calicrin, and that activated bradykinin, which is the endpoint, which leads to these broad uh, reactions leading to vasodilation and the anaphylactoid response. So cutting a long story short, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over this. We showed that this contaminant in a dose response fashion did that. A lot of the controls were done. These were the 29 different contaminant passages that we had. We were able to demonstrate those that had a response could activate those that did not, did not, and it correlated with the percentage of oversulfated chondroitin. What was interesting, and we we'd also opened a new biology because it was not only the contact system, but also the complement system that was activated, which is another key agent for the anaphylacto anaphylacto toxins, which is a C5A and C3A. It's complicated, but cutting a long story short, what we were able to show is that um, there was a crosstalk between these two pathways mediated by negatively charged polymer going through 12A to activate bradykinin and C5A. I'm, again, not going to go through the details of all of this in the interest of time. Several different controls were done to be able to demonstrate that uh, there was a particular pathway. Now, the point that I want to emphasize in the next couple of minutes is that once we knew bi biologically what was going on, we needed to find out uh, what was happening in vivo. Ironically, several of the pharmaceutical companies who wanted to get to it started with in vivo studies, and no small animals responded. So there was a mismatch. It didn't work in mice. It didn't work in rats. It didn't work in even rabbits. It turned out where it really worked was on pigs. Uh, it, was, uh, it was an amazing coincidence that pigs had the same anaphylactoid response like humans did. In fact, they even went to the extent of studying in horses to see if some of these things worked. So we got lucky, but this is an unfortunate side story where much of these pig experiments was done in Virginia Tech, precisely the week and the day after the first year anniversary of the Virginia Tech massacre because they thought this is a way they could give back to the country. So there's a side story here that I'm not going to be able to go. But the long and short of it is this uh, veterinarians in Virginia Tech essentially could recapitulate what was seen in patients in pigs with the contaminated heparin as against the control heparin uh, and, and the various controls that, uh, that went into it. So in summary, what we were able to show was not only what the contaminant was, but what the pathway was in terms of the activation of both the contact and the crosstalk it had with complementation in pigs to essentially recapitulate what was observed in humans. And then the final study in the CDC was to be able to close the loop to show what was observed in, uh, in pigs was essentially the same thing that were seen with these patients in the clinic. And I wouldn't be standing here in front of you and have the privilege to be able to do that if it was not for this team effort of convergence to tackle a complex problem but bring in, in a variety of different technologies to address it. There were several side stories. The media got engaged. Heparin became a household name in the United States because uh, there was a, uh, a feud between uh, you know, China and, 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 and the United States, the, the Chinese FDA and the US FDA, and, and China basically said it was not coming from China, it was essentially Baxter in the United States. Congress was close behind. Uh, you heard the brief clipping. Uh, it was called the Hepburn disaster hearing. The FDA was in the hot seat, but that led to several important policies in terms of resources that the FDA needed in terms of making sure that adequate technology was needed not only to ensure medicine safety, but how it formed the basis of the, of the pathway for biosimilars and biologics, where about close to about $100 million billion worth of drugs are going to go off patent. And needless to say, there were several different editorials that not only framed the issue in terms of the kinds of things that become critical for policy, for science, application of technology in the context of uh, where the FDA is, because that's where the future of medicine is, and needless to say how medical practice uh, needed to address this issue. And as I said before, the most humbling experience is the fact that um, the significant outcome was the fact that we could save uh, patients' lives. So um, I'd like to end my presentation acknowledging uh, a whole group of uh, people behind uh, 
uh, this work, and uh, if, if it was not for that, uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you the story. As I said, there's science, there's intrigue, there was politics. More importantly, we saved lives. Thank you very much.